Can you hear me? Hi, everyone, and uh, I wish you a good afternoon. <coughs> Still on a, a pr another presentation for ST Microelectronics. What's interesting is that it makes the link with what has been present presented by my colleagues who were uh, just before. Um, what we're going to present now is goes a bit beyond the technical aspects. So you've seen something around Secure Manager, the robust root of trust that is brought by ST on general purpose microcontroller, on wireless microcontrollers, MPUs, and so on. So what we are going to introduce here is about the regulation. Because I would say that what is easy at some point is to deliver some technical stuff to cover security, so we introduce the secure boot, the secure firmware update, the crypto, all these various security components that are necessary to build a robust IoT solution. So as engineers, all of us think that, OK, we have to cope with some security requirements. We put flesh on the bone. We, we deliver some security stuff, and that's it. But it goes beyond this. What I stake here now is the regulation, because all around the world, Government agency identify some potential risk. We face these day-to-day -day security attacks from uh, organized group, hackers, and all these, all these various type of people today, they want to get value, to get control of our identity, privacy, and so on. So we have spoke about, so we have spoken about the root of trust, and now we are going to speak a bit more about the regulation and how thanks to ST solution, we can cover the vast majority of security requirements, lifting the complexity of the final product conformance to this regulation. So I will be quick about this. Just a word about STM30, ST Microelectronics. This is a quite large manufacturer. We still a sort of semiconductor uh, supermarket, selling micros, memories, uh, smart cards, uh, sensors, products for automotive, and so on, with a global footprint, uh, huge revenue, and uh, many people all around the world doing sales, marketing, development, and so on. Something that is really interesting is that we have a wide portfolio of microcontrollers targeting different market segments. We have, at the bottom, wireless MCU supporting uh, 802.15.4, .4, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, LP1 with uh, Muti, uh, Sigfox, and LoRaWAN. Then you have ultra-low power MCUs for embedded application. Uh, we think about uh, some very low power application, earring ends, this sort of thing. Then you have mainstream MCU, which are general purpose MCU covering uh, multiple vertical markets. High performance MCU where processing and uh, real time is at the core. And on top of this, we have now MPU, MPUs. Uh, MP1 is on the market for quite a long time. And I invite you to come and see MP2, which is a brand new generation of uh, high performance MPU. And we have up to four demos with AI, all that stuff. On, on my side, I will focus on wireless MCU. And the latest one that has been introduced, which is WBA5. Uh, it is inspired by what ST has been doing for a couple of years, meaning having mainstream MCU and ultra power MCUs with a robust and proven root of trust. So here we speak about connectivity with radio plus security. Regarding certification and regulation, if we look at this at a high level, there are three different aspects. First is about the standard. There are many standards on the market today. Some come from government or national agency. Some come from the private sector. Here we speak about Etsy, which is a sort of private organization, which is quite famous for its involvement in uh, telecom business. We have CSA. There are many CSAs, too many. If some of you were, were here yesterday, I present something around Matter, which is a, connect, a standard for wireless connectivity, CSA stands for Connectivity Standard Alliance, which is a big US consortium, but with, um, with companies from Europe, from Japan, and so on. And next to uh, the, their involvement in Zigbee and Matter, they have developed their own security certification scheme. 
So that's something important. So it can be voluntary. In the case of uh, CSA that is aligned with the US Cybertrust mark, I will, I will explain about this. Uh, people are not obliged to get a sort of security certification. It's based on their will to value the security of their product. Next to that, you have regulation. Some coming from Europe. Some may come from the US. And uh, the last one is uh, from Singapore. Singapore is a small state, but they have a strong influence in Asia, uh, excluding China. So it's quite important to monitor what's happening in Singapore. And what is really interesting is that in terms of regulation, we see convergence. Last aspect is our label. All of you know much about the energy label that we have on white goods and multiple types of products. And the, the next one is about the US Cybertrust mark, which is new. It was um, launched last year. And in the end, we will have this sort of logo, QR code, and so on around the security level of uh, consumer product. So that's something that's, that, that's coming as well. Regarding Radio Equipment Directive and Cyber Resilience Act, here we focus on Europe. Um, in Europe, you may have heard about GDPR, which is now part of our daily life. It took time. Um, it was not as smooth as uh, we could imagine, but today it's in place. And at ST, we consider that RAID and CRA uh, will have the same, uh, will have the same uh, story at some point, meaning that it's still fuzzy. There's still uncertainty about the way they will be applied. At the time, they will come into force, but it will happen. Regarding RAID, uh, I would say there are two specific ac aspects that have to be covered. Um, first of all, um, date of application is the 1st of October 2025, which is more or less one year from now. Um, so that's quite uh, surprising, knowing that today we don't have a full understanding about the way to make product conformant to this coming regulation. So it's still tricky to, to fully understand Will it come into application or not, knowing that today we don't know the standards that come along with this regulation? Um, so th this is the timeline. CRA uh, should be there two years after. At some point, CRA we, we should repel RED. It's a sort of superset of the radio equipment directive. The thing is that with RED, uh, we cover final products, devices. Uh, with CRA, it will apply to subcomponents as well, meaning software libraries, silicon devices. Uh, so, from the ST standpoint, at some point, RAID is not my problem because it's a problem for device maker. But these are our customers, and we cover it to support them. But we will not uh, be out of the scope of CRA. So, in the end, any company putting product on the market in the European Union. If the product features a digital element, it would fall under the CRA in 2027. So that's a very important milestone. And I would say it starts now because uh, selling product in two to three or four years from now means that security requirements have to be taken into account right now during product development phase. So what I stake in red, these are two key elements. First is when the product is placed on the market, it mustn't feature any known vulnerability. So that means that if the vendor is aware of some severe security vulnerabilities, he has to fix them. Otherwise, it's a breach in the requirement. Second, second thing is about the possibility to push for updates and patches during the product lifetime. The tricky thing is that there's no obligation to deliver security patches. But there's an obligation to have this mechanism in place. So it's quite subtle, but it is the way it is written. But in any case, with CRA, company we have the obligation to have this feature in place and to deliver uh, patches and security measures to remediate the security vulnerabilities. So at some point, we can consider this is more or less the same things. One of our very important aspects of the CRA is the obligation to disclose vulnerability. That's the case for ST. If you have a look at the P3 page, P3 is a PSIRT uh, uh, acronym, meaning that we have the obligation 
to communicate on the security vulnerability that have been spotted internally by third party, by labs, by the community, or by anyone. This is a legal obligation now. So that will be the case for any device maker as well. So if you focus, it was about Europe. In the US, we have the US Cybertrust mark. Uh, it is in line with an initiative launched by the NIST, which is a national institute for standards and technology. If some of you are interested in security, NIST is at the head of many initiatives around cryptography, around security in general. If you have a look at post-quantum cryptography, today the reference document, the reference uh, approach comes from NIST as well. Uh, so it targets IoT device for the smart home first, uh, but we may consider that in the end it will focus on smart industry, it will cover all sectors of uh, where we can find some sort of connectivity. Uh, regarding the scheme in itself, meaning the process, the NIST has laid down the, 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 the features thanks to the NIST 8425 security uh, standard, but it will be operated by the FCC in 2024. So there are now this scheme is in place for the US. It stays voluntary, but we may consider that for sensitive products in the future, this aspect will be mandatory. Um, one practical aspect, I mentioned CSA, the Connectivity Standard Alliances, Alliance. Uh, one thing which is interesting is uh, the approach is to fight against fragmentation. If we consider IoT security, there are standards coming from Europe, there are standards coming from the US, from Japan. I don't include China because in China there are multiple standards today. We don't cover them for the moment, but when they will be public and established, we will have to cover them as well. So it's quite very complex to understand where to go, how to cover all these standards. And there was this initiative at the CSA to cover three different standards and have some sort of superset to have a chance to cover every IoT standard for consumer devices. Next to that, the, I spoke about the initiative in Singapore. This is the CLS uh, pushed by the Cyber Security Agency. This is another CSA. I mentioned we have too many CSAs. And what's interesting here is that there's convergence between the initiative in Singapore, the US Cybertrust mark pushed by CSA in the US, and then RAID and CIA. We hope to see convergence just to, to solve this security conundrum. Regarding Singapore, just to mention, there are multiple security levels regarding robustness. That is something really important. Why, contrary to CLS and uh, other uh, semiconductor uh, security standard, in RED and in uh, US Cyber Trust Mark, there's no notion of robustness, meaning that as long as the features are present in the product, the vendor are, has demonstrated they are, really, they are implemented for real. There's no obligation to have some sort of robustness against software attack, hardware attacks. It's not the case today. We consider that it will come in the future, but today there's no notion of robustness. Regarding ST, ST doesn't sell, I would say, final product. We sell silicon devices, we sell platforms, because in the end we sell more than silicon. We offer embedded software, we offer development tools, we offer kits that you can get for free on our ST booth. Uh, and beyond this, we offer services as well. Uh, that what was explained by Sui regarding secure manager, protection of third party application, and so on. So what we deliver are secure platforms that have been certified against CZIP and PSA. We speak about the silicon platform, more or less a silicon device plus some low level uh, embedded software to cover security regulation and security standard. What's at stake here is security enablement meaning that by taking this certified silicon platform, the OEM, the device maker, has the possibility to be conformant easily against US Cybertrust Mark, RED, CRA, some UL standard for medical application, 
for IEC, against IEC 64443 in the case of industrial application. So we leave the complexity of security certification thanks to what has been done by ST at the silicon device level. So our objective is to make customer life easier regarding security certification. So if you focus on this radio equipment directive, first aspect is that it will be, it will be mandatory. You know that uh, our US colleagues tend to consider that in Europe, we love to regulate. We love, we love to create obligation, and that's the case for the radio equipment directive. It's based on standards. I would say today there are two approaches. First is to go to a laboratory to have the product evaluated by security experts. The specific name is notified body, if you already had a look at the doc related document. It's based on standard. You have the possibility to do this on a voluntary base, but the alternative is to do some sort of self-assessment, meaning that each device maker has the possibility to self-evaluate his device against a set of security standards. Second point is conformity assessment. This assessment, uh, I just mentioned this, has to be done internally or by a notified body. And the last aspect is around market surveillance, meaning that any device maker needs to have a close, close watch at, ab at about what's happening from the regulation standpoint. Will it evolve when it is applied? Meaning that it's not just placing the products on the market, it's about uh, looking at what are the legal obligations uh, against the, the, the sold product. And on top of this, one thing which is really important is the CE mark. Everyone knows the CE mark, but regarding radio product, to get the CE mark, the product has to be conformant to the red requirements. So that is a high level uh, description of red. The initial regulatory framework was laid down in 2014. It was about it, first, it was about the radio requirement. Then there was an extension to cybersecurity in 2021. And there are three key aspects. First, the device mustn't harm the network, meaning that the device mustn't flood packets on the network, just disturbing the network and, let's say, the, the operation of the, the network of devices. Second aspect is around protecting the personal data and privacy of the vendor and the user. What's at the core here is the protection of the European citizen. I, I mentioned GDPR, but at some point that's more or less the same mindset. How do I protect the citizen that have some uh, digital devices? How do I protect their privacy? How do I protect uh, their keys? Their, what, what's, what's really important? Uh, from their, uh, for in their daily life. And the second aspect is around ensuring protection from fraud. Here we can speak about payments. One thing to mention is that we all have some uh, payment cards with NFC interface, which is a radio interface. And in fact, payment cards fall under the scope of fraud as well. So that's something quite binding in the end. So what at stake in red? The easy answer is that more or less Every device, is, every device that has an antenna, every device that supports radio communication will fall under the scope of this regulation. Um, it can be about child care devices, consumer devices, and uh, in the case of some financial transaction with payment cards, we fall under the red as well. Another aspect is there are, is there are some exceptions. There are full exemption for medical devices. Medical devices are quite sensitive in terms of security. The fact is, for medical devices, there's a specific regulation. So the authority has considered that as it, this type of device has its own regulation, there's no need to have it covered by red, so they are excluded. Beyond this, we, we can exclude, at least partially, uh, aircraft parts, motor vehicles, and toll system as well. But I would say that it's not material compared to the consumer IoT applications. So starting from these three key requirements, we are going to go to more specific security requirements, which are technical requirements, I would say. Here we have a quite long list. 
I would say at some point it's quite obscure and obfuscated. Uh, it's about uh, the feature that the device has to cover to meet this free high-level requirement. It's about imple implementing appropriate security control. It's about device attestation, device authentication. It's about protecting the security asset. Does the feature have some sort of secure storage, secure key uh, protection, all these sort of things? In fact, we have a list that comes from two annexes, one or two. Uh, it's a sort of implementation document, I would say. So we have this list. It's for the specialist, definitely. But any, any connected device with a radio interface has to cover this security requirement. So starting from this, what ST can do to meet this long list of requirements? You may have heard that today we do some security certification. I mentioned PSA certified. We have CZIP as well. Uh, they are equivalent, in fact. Uh, ARM started first with PSA certified. But then came CZIP, which is a larger uh, security scheme with more flexibility and the possibility to cover a wide range of product. So here we have some classes of security function. Uh, first group is about identification and attestation of platform. Platform, once again, is a silicon device plus some low-level software to manage secure boot, secure firmware update, and to have some basic security services. That's what we call platform. So here we, sp we speak about platform attestation. How do we prove that it is a real uh, connected device coming from ST, coming from the vendor, and so on? How can we prove its genuineness? How can we prove that it was properly initialized? Uh, does it boot the right way? So we have some sort of a long list of security requirements. Then on the right, how can we guarantee that we can have secure communication between this device and other devices, or between the devices and the backend, which is on, on the cloud? Next to that, Another aspect is around product lifecycle. It's about product commissioning. How do we reinitialize the device in the case we move it from one place to another? How, how do we decommission the device? So all of these are some sort of long list of security requirements. And depending on the, pro on the product profile, each vendor or each silicon vendor can pick the relevant list of security functions that are covered by the platform. So this is, a free, uh, this is a first set of security functions. We have another set. Something that is uh, quite important to ST, the set is about the attacker level. Here, we have the possibility to cover physical attacker resistant, which is commonplace in smart card devices. We can claim as well some software attacker resistance. In the case, the product is an entry-level product. We don't claim any side channel robustness for the crypto accelerator, for the secure boot, for this, this kind of thing. So we can limit the scope to uh, software attacker resistance. So it's a sort of toolbox where each vendor can pick the relevant security function. Then there are things around cryptography. Uh, what is key in cryptography is about the, the quality of the random number generation. So a quite long list of technical requirements. So one thing which is of importance, we have this long list, and I will go back to this again. What's the, the, the good thing with CZIP is that it's becoming a European standard. So on the left, that's what we have in one of STM32 uh, product. It applies to the wireless MCU STM32 WBA, which is a BAD product covering uh, ZigBee as well. Uh, we have more or less the same list of security functions with STM32U5, which is a ultra low power product. We have it with H5 as well, that was presented just before. So starting from this long list of security functions that are claimed by ST, that are tested by uh, an independent laboratory. If you have some question about the way uh, laboratory works, I invite you to discuss with Alec Gorgiev, who is just on the front row. He's a, he's a former colleague now working for AGS Brightside. Starting from the security functions that have been tested by the lab and certified by the certification body, we can map the security function to the radio equipment directive. And if there's one thing to remember, is that starting from the work that has been done by ST, 
we cover, let's say, 80% of the requirements for the radio equipment directive. What's left in the end are, let's say, everything related to network security. I would say that this requirement happens at the application level, and we are not involved in this business. ST is a silicon vendor developing security platform. So in the case you're interested in this, having this remaining security function covered by STM32WA, WBA, by U5, H5, and so on, we have partners. We can give you guidance, advisor, advisory around this, and we are partners that can cover this security function. But what's left, in fact, is a small part of the requirement of the radio equipment directive. So in fact, thanks to what we've, has been done at the CESIB level, you can get rid of the, let's say, the major part of the complexity of compliance to RED, in fact. So that's the end. If I have some free takeaways to, to, to demonstrate, first, we CESIP, we can speed up the conformance to the radio equipment directive conformance. That is the case for RED, and it will be the case with CRA. We've done one mapping for the RED. We can do the same for CRA. But CRA will come in 2027. Bad things happen right now for product development. So the key security function are supported. CZIP is now a European standard. That means that it has visibility. So, uh, and we hope that in the end, people in charge of RED, CRA, and so on will recognize CZIP as a way to be conformant to this regulation. Second point is ST is a key supplier for RED conformance. ST has been involved in uh, silicon platform security certification for five years. Yesterday, we have celebrated the five years of PSA certified. ST was an early adopter, so there's nothing new. And by default, for any new silicon device we place on the market, any new microcontrollers, we, uh, we want to have it security certified against CZIP level 3. So that is a de facto thing we deliver for a new, new uh, microcontroller. So we have CZIP target in mind from the ground up. So that's what we call security by design. So third point, there are still some limitations. So I as mentioned, some red requirements cannot be covered by ST. It's about securing the network. So as mentioned, we, have, we can deliver advisory. We have partners that cover this aspect if you don't want to, to cover it by yourself. And then there are still the need to go through the evaluation process either for self-assessment, meaning each vendor, we take this list of security functions from the red, and we do a declaration against the security features that are uh, embedded in the product. Or the second approach is to go to the notified body, to go to AGS by site, Rescure, UL, and many others on the market, to have the product assessed by, let's say, a sort of security authority. So that's all I, want to, I wanted to explain to you about CZIP, RED, and the coming regulation. That's something really serious. And uh, if you have some question about this right now or later on on the ST booth, uh, feel free to come. Uh, we are present on all 4A just next to, to here. And uh, let me know. Question? Question? So, so just like we are, we say, OK, I can open the debate. If you're interested in having some sort of pre-assessment or security evaluation against RED, we have taken the initiative to work hand in hand with the labs. It applies to the silicon platform in itself, but this type of security evaluation can be extending to the device. So that can be some reuse, starting from the work that will have been done by ST, provided that you use the silicon device that we have put in the scope of evaluation, you can reuse this work and have your own device evaluating against the red requirements. So it's a sort of fast track to go to red conformance. Thank you.